This is Things Police See, First Hand Accounts, with your host, Steve Gold. Hey guys, welcome to the podcast that interviews active and retired police officers about their most intense, bizarre, and sometimes humorous moments on the job. With me as always, Ken Roy Ball. Ken, how are you, sir? I'm good. Here I am. Excellent. Always good to have you. Uh, today we have a we have a guy that's um, been in law enforcement a long time. Long, a long time. He's still there. That's he. Oh, he's still on the job. Well, that is that's a long time plus forty two years. Ken, ah, oh, it's crazy, crazy because he, uh, you know, he should be taking walks on the beach in his Bermuda shorts and socks <laughs> and sandals. Yes. With a Hawaiian shirt. Yes. I was just going to, you took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> I've never seen so many Hawaiian shirts than when I worked at Backgrounds. Standard issue, standard issue retirement for California. Also the mustache goatee um, thing. That's also mm-hmm. like a standard issue retired cop uh, motif. Yeah. I don't know why it is, but you know, the Hawaiian shirt thing, <laughs> it's like, it doesn't even matter what you're wearing. You could be wearing your pajamas and a Hawaiian shirt. So... Uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, he should be really relaxing, but you know what, who knows, you know, it's people, uh, people like to keep active and if you have a love of the job, uh, keep on keeping on. It looks like he does love the job cause he worked for Yuma PD for many years. Now he works for, um, uh, college in Arizona. I don't want to say it cause he's on the job there. I'm not sure if he's comfortable with that, but, uh, when a little Google search of him and you can see, um, that he's like high-fiving students, handing out candy. Like he's like into it. He, he, he looks like he's really enjoying himself, which is cool. Oh, cool. Is he, um, is he a police officer there? Yeah. Campus police officer. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Have I said his name well, yet? I don't, you have not. I don't know who he is. No. <laughs> Gregory, <laughs> Gregory fell is his name and he's waiting uh, patiently for us. So, uh, so uh, let's, let's give him the hookup. Let me just warn everyone that my, iPhone, while it's pristine condition, it's an iPhone 10. It's like, it's like butter, Ken. Oh, I took it out of the case. IPhone. It's in perfect shape. The lightning yeah. port sucks. Like it's starting to fail. Um, what? On a 10? Yeah. Yeah. It just doesn't. I've been using the wireless charger lately because the port is like, it's, if you wiggle it at all the wrong way, it disconnects. Oh. Which sucks for us because this is our guest line. So, um, I'm just just warning everybody. I'm gonna call him right now, and I'm I'm hoping that uh, it just I'm not gonna touch it. I'm not even gonna I'm not even gonna fart. <laughs> Jeez, please well, don't. If I do, it'll be very quiet. <laughs> Here we go. Officer Fell, AWC Police Department. How you doing, sir? It's Steve Gould with Things Police See. Thank you for coming on the show. Steve Gould, finally nice to hear from you. How are you, sir? Very good. Also with me is my co-host, Ken Royball. Hey, hey. Hi, Ken Royball. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Hey, we are good here in Yuma, Arizona. It's going to be about 103 today. Oh, Oof. man. Reminds me of those old yeah. days in California where that I don't live anymore. Uh but uh, I am in Washington State, where it's going to be a sunny 55 and rainy. Bam, there you go. We, we rarely get any rain here. Yeah, Arizona's like a, it's like an oven. It's like, and there's, you guys yep. don't have any spring either, right? Just summer, just bam, all of a sudden it's 110. Yep, well, and that's what happened this year. We, we went from 75 to 95 in like a day. Wow. Mm. So, Greg, yep. you... You're brought to us by a friend of the show, Christine Roof, who is a coworker of yours? That is correct. She also works here at the community college here in Yuma, uh, Arizona Western College. She's uh, she's part of the health and wellness. Got it. Yeah, she's yep. awesome. She's been um, been a uh, good fan, and uh, she brought us a guest, so we're always grateful for that. You, yeah, yeah. You've been a police officer for a long time, Greg. You've been on the job, um, if I'm doing my math right, 42 years total in law yeah. enforcement, correct? Yes, 1978. Oh, man. Oh, Bam. man. And you started, yep. just give us a little synopsis of what we're what we're dealing with here. Okay, uh, well, 
I was I, I worked at McDonald's hamburger. I had an older brother who was a cop, worked for Yuma Police, and I went right I went on ride alongs with him, and that's why I, I always sell ride alongs to everybody who wants to be a cop. Go on a ride along. I was hooked. I said, you know what? I can do this job. I want to be a cop. So I got uh, I tested, got hired, and it's just been a great it's just, it's been great for uh, 42 years. Wow! I want to let you know that whatever you're doing, we're picking it all up. So if you're flicking something or a pen cap. <laughs> oh, well, that's me. That's what I was doing. Yeah, because no, I because I do the <laughs> okay. same thing. I have a little um, pen here and I click it. Oh, yes. And uh, sometimes I have to edit it out. So I'm just telling you up front. Well, um, you okay. remember, Stephen, we had uh, that one guest and he was eating his cereal and his, his spoon was clinking the bowl. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was funny, man. That was funny. Wow. Well, I, I don't want to be that guy. Yeah, I've, I, I've lost that object. I no longer have it. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> All right, so you knew right from the beginning you wanted to be a police officer. How many years did you do with Yuma? Uh, I did 28. Well, I did 31. I did 28 as patrol, and then I retired, and I went into that civilian position as a patrol support officer. Uh, that was a lot of stinking paperwork. We took all of the thefts, the, the stolen cars, the burglaries, anything to do with with a, an investigation, we did as long as there was not a suspect and we didn't arrest them. So we took all the paper. But then a job came open at the uh, community college, and I've always loved working in schools. So here I am. And Greg, I can tell you love the job. I, you know, we did did a quick Google search of you, and I, I'm seeing you high fiving students. You're handing out candy. Like this isn't like you didn't drag your ass to this job to to earn keep earning money. You you genuinely love it. Oh, absolutely. My, my whole philosophy cha- changed on the human race when I started to work in the schools. I was a DARE officer starting in 1993, and then from DARE, I went into being an SRO, a school resource officer at the high schools and the junior high. And, man, that, that just changed my image of the young people and then just people in general because there's parents attached to every student, and it was great. And I would recommend that every officer – should have a term where they serve as a school officer for at least two years, if that if that was possible. Awesome. Yeah, my father actually was the first D.A.R.E. officer in the state of Massachusetts, and he really enjoyed it as well. Oh, wow. Absolutely. absolutely. D.A.R.E. was yeah, – it, it just changed everything. Yeah, he – um, or he was one of the first officers, but he, uh, he was kind of bummed at the end of it where he really liked it, and he went to my elementary school and, and taught a class, I think, once a week or something. Um, but he was really bummed at the, um, the stats for the program years later when they didn't think it was effective, you know, but he still enjoyed it. Right, absolutely. And, you know, when I, when I first started the, in the D.A.R.E. program and I was a D.A.R.E. officer at this one elementary school, just to tell you, just to show you how things have changed, the principal thought – that we shouldn't really be wearing our guns with the gun belt and to leave the gun in the car. This was 1993. So hmm. just to see how, how full circle we've come, it would be unheard of to walk around now without a gun in your, in your holster. Wow. Yeah. That, that's, that's like yeah. a staple of a policeman is gun, you know? Uh, absolutely. The gun and the badge. Absolutely. That's interesting. Ken, did they have, yep. um, they have dare going on in LA? They must've. Well, I must say, I believe Dare started in Los Angeles with oh. Daryl F. Gates. I think so. So, um, yeah, along yeah. with yeah, the, you, I'm sorry. No, no I was going to say, yeah, I, I believe you are correct. I think Dare did start in Los Angeles. Yes, yes, Daryl Gates yep. started it, and so we were the uh, on the forefront of Dare. And uh, police consent decrees from the federal government. We did both those. We were the first. So, right. uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, that was a big deal back then. The D.A.R.E. officers were out there and and they would go to the schools and hang out and do whatever they did. But uh, it was a big deal. I think that was, no, that wasn't back when Nancy Reagan had Just Say No. I can't. Was that during Just Say No? Uh, I, I think so. Yeah. A, a lot of it had to deal with, remember the, the, uh, shoot, the, the agent that was killed, uh, Camarena got tortured Kiki. and killed in Mexico. Yeah. Kiki Camarena. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a lot of that had to do with him too. Yeah. That was, uh, oh, you're taking me way back. Oh way yeah. Back. Oh yeah. Yep. Now, the program was great. Cause I mean, while it, they, you know, they don't think it was that effective to keep kids away from drugs, but it, 
it did serve another purpose where it got kids interacting with police at a young age. And I know it had an impact on my classmates all the way through school just to get to, you get to know a cop at least, you know? Well, Oh, absolutely. The, the connection with the community was great because it was also the parents and then, you know, all your educators. So it, yeah, I, I think we found out the same thing that the statistics really didn't show that it was really effective in keeping people off of drugs, that the young folks off of drugs, but there was that connection with the community. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Very important. Mm-hmm. Very yep. cool. Yep. Greg, can you tell us about the first time you responded to uh, what you would consider to be a hot call or, you know, something where your adrenaline dumped? Yes. Uh, that's when uh, I, I just been, you know, during my FTO program, I, I hardly bumped into anything that was significant and then, of course, I, I passed, and they, they sent me out as a solo beat officer. And I remember going to that family fight. We called them family fights back then. And I got there, and, of course, our department hadn't – we had not morphed into portable radios yet. So once you left the patrol car, that was it on communication. And, of course, we didn't have cell phones back in 1970, stinking nine. And then uh, I remember <laughs> being inside the house, and the, and the husband and wife, middle-aged, and, boy, they were, they were slobber-knocking drunk. And I remember him asking me questions, and, you know, they were not uh, agreeing too much on things that night. And I told him something that he didn't like, and that's when he said, well, you know what? I'm going to go down the hall and get my gun. Cool. And he went down the hall, and, man, I brand new. I, I went to the house phone, called dispatch, and said, hey, I need units here right now. And then he emerged from the hall. I don't even think my gun was out. I, I just – I was still so new and naive. I, I just – felt i guess things would be okay luckily he emerged from the hall did not have a gun because i was looking at his hands that's the first thing i probably did right and then uh i just remember him sitting down a lazy boy and then everybody's coming through the front door to include my sergeant and i told my sergeant what the gentleman had said to me and the sergeant said well officer fell you were going to arrest him right now and i did oh man Mm. yeah that is a very very good first story and just shows how how green you are when you're a new cop, you know, that, uh, I mean, 10 years in your career, you would have tackled that guy in the hallway and, and cuffed him up. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. He, 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 he would not have reached, he would not have reached the bedroom. I don't think. Oh man. You must've been sweating it. Yeah. Well, you know, and again, I, I didn't, I just wasn't processing, I guess right away, but boy, when the shift was over and I went home, then it processed. I bet. Yeah. What, what could have happened? Yep. Hmm. Were you alone, Greg, at this point? <clears throat> like one-man car? Yeah. I, I, yeah, we, we uh, were always a solo, uh, one guy to a car. I, I'm sure that somebody must have been dispatched with me, but I'm not remembering that part. It's so amazing so how I, much domestics have changed. Like, because, you know, my father became a cop in the 70s as well. And um, it, it, like, on the East Coast anyways, it was like, you know, now it's the preferred response is arrest and the preferred response is arrest the primary aggressor, which is the male. But back in the day, like you're saying, they called them family fights. If the, if it didn't matter who was beat up, if no one wanted to press charges, you just left. Um, you'd respond alone. Right. You'd go in the house alone, you know, without, without someone. Um, it's just right. so yeah. different. Yeah. We used to divorce right. people. I, used to what? Yeah, I know. I, I, we, used, we used to divorce people. When they, then they go, okay, cool, cool. And they thought they were divorced and then we wouldn't go back. <laughs> yeah. You know, I can remember going to one family fight and this, this husband just knocked the dog do out of the wife. She was bleeding profusely, a uh, severe injury rescue showed up, but she kept saying, no, 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 he's okay. Don't arrest him. Don't arrest him. So we, we cleared the call. No one goes to jail and she was just beat to a pulp. Ooh. Because she didn't, because she didn't want to prosecute, we we didn't, we don't arrest. Yeah. Well, that all that all changed in the '80s, I believe. Uh, Greg, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but back in the '80s, we used to just, uh, you know, if it was it was common, we go, okay, uh, what do you want to do? Uh, we can arrest him. No, 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 blah blah. We'd leave, and then apparently somewhere around the United States, uh, women be were turning up dead, you know, because of these family disputes. And then the courts took over and decided that, no, that's not going to work. And they started making uh, it to be a felony. And then we were arresting people right and left as soon as that law came into play. Right, because with another thing they were noticing, 
that we would continue to go to the same address over and over again and nothing's getting done. So I think the state did take over and says, you know what, we'll be the victim if we have to, and let's start arresting people. And you're right, I want to say around 80, 82, 83, 84, somewhere in there. Yeah, I can't remember. I do remember one yeah. time when it first came out, it was a it was a felony, and the bill at the time, this is in the early '80s, was about uh, five thousand. It was five thousand dollars, and I had you know we started with that, and then I I went inside for a little bit, and then went back in the field um, a few years later, and I was working patrol, and we arrested this guy for domestic violence. And he's sitting there. He goes, "I, I got, I got to go to work. I can't, I can't be in jail." And I says, "Oh, don't worry about it. It's only five thousand dollars." So I had been out of the field for a minute. I had come back and I talked to my partner. Says, "Yeah, the guy's got to go to work. So we, you know, that's all he's concerned about." And then I found out the bail. I told him it was five thousand. It had gone up in that time to fifty thousand. And uh, <laughs> I had to go deliver the bad news to him, man. But that tells you. How pissed yeah. off they were getting about these domestic domestic violence calls. They up the bill pretty wow. dramatically. And now, the, I don't, now I I I don't remember the part that a domestic was automatically a felony. I that I don't that part I don't remember. But I do remember. Yeah, if you had any PC at all, uh, the the violator, the aggressor goes to jail. Yeah, and it was um, it was where if uh, if somebody originally it was if somebody the, usually it's the lady said that he hit me or he put his hands on me we'd arrest the guy and it would be a felony it was this was in California and then later oh, right. on they decided that if anybody had marks it didn't we weren't there to to decide you know uh, whether he was attacking her or she was attacking him if they had a scratch mark on them whoever had the mark was the victim. And the and the other person would go to jail. And if um, if they both had marks, whether they were defensive or offensive, we weren't there to adjudicate. You know the the case right there. They would both go to jail. Absolutely, I can remember several times I took both, and then they started to revise that a little bit, saying, "Okay, folks, you know what? We got to investigate here a little bit. We got to use some discretion. Let's get the aggressor." Yes. I understand if both people are injured and they're having that knockdown drag out, but you're going to have to investigate a little bit, and we got to get the aggressor. So, right, they mm-hmm. kind of they started to revise that. Yeah, they hated yeah. that when you arrested both of them. Toward toward yeah. 2016 was the last year I was a cop, but that was like the DAs were like, "Don't." That's the least preferable response to arrest. Right, to arrest right. Because then you 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 know there's a risk that you're 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 traumatizing the victim, obviously. Right. But yeah. um. Yeah, that 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 uh, they try to make it simple. I think, like, just just arrest the guy or just the primary aggressor. There's just nothing simple about a domestic. There's no. They're trying to make it easy for the boots on the ground. And then I remember the last training I went to. It was like, well, if she's a primary aggressor, but you, but she, they did this this video case like for us, and it was like if, but you see that he was taking his rings off, and she knew this was a precursor to her beatings, but she took a baseball bat to him before that happened. Even though that's a felony, you should arrest him if there's evidence. You know, it was like, whoa, right? This is getting right. crazy. It, like, it, 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 yep, yep, I hear you. It was getting crazy. Wow. So, yep. um, Greg, can you describe to us the most uh, bizarre or strange thing you've dealt with? Yeah, that. Well, that's got to be when they stole the police car uh, right out <laughs> from under my nose. That, <laughs> not that was not good. Yeah, not embarrassing at all. Uh, we responded. We're, we're the night shift. We're ready to get off work. And then at about 5, 36 in the morning, uh, some guy uh, climbed into a, a big old metal utility pole. And uh, so we get there. We find two drunk passengers in the truck. It's a little mini truck. But the driver had fled on foot. The, the passengers were slobber knocking drunk. So we put them in separate patrol cars and just kind of, you know, to, so we could start investigating and then some of the officers went and to go to the registered owner's uh, residence to, you know, to find him and, you know, let's get him charged for hit and, hit and run. Anyway, uh, me and another a cop were just sitting there watching the scene, waiting for the cops to get back with the uh, driver. And then, uh, like I say, I had put a guy in uh, my patrol car, and we left the windows down. It's you, Arizona. It's hot. They're not suspects. They're not arrested. 
And so I want him to be comfortable. Well, this Yehu, he reaches out, uh, pops the door on, uh, uh, open, crawls out. And instead of just maybe fleeing and running away, thinking he's a suspect when he's not, he climbs into the driver's seat. So me and the cop, were, we're looking at the scene. The cop car is behind me. I, I don't know why it was behind me, but but it was. And I hear this vehicle accelerating, and I turn around, and this cop car is going through the landscape, and he's he's hot on a call. I'm going, <laughs> oh, hey, that, that, that guy's responding to a hot call. And then I'm realizing I didn't hear anything over the radio. And I look in, in, into the vehicle closer as it's starting to speed away. And it's my stinking drunk shirtless passenger, and he's taken off with the car. Oh, so, uh, man, right then you just get this horrible feeling. I've lost my job, this and that. Oh, yeah. So I, so yeah, so I run to the other patrol car that's got the other drunk guy in the back, and man, I take off after this guy, and I call it in five hundred three police car. Only time in my twenty eight patrol man <laughs> career I said that, and so I'm after this guy. And he goes into the uh, intersection. He spins out. There's this uh, going to work in the morning traffic all around him. And he starts going uh, uh, northbound and the southbound lane on the on our main drag, which is called 4th Ave. I'm getting behind him. I got my license iron on to let people know that a car, uh, that cop car in front of me is not an official guy. <laughs> oh, Get out man. of the way. <laughs> he spins out again. He goes over the median. He corrects. Now we're going to go northbound on the northbound. So at least we're going the right direction. Spins out again, smacks the rear of the uh, axle uh, up against the curb, snaps it. So now the car is disabled. I pull my patrol car right up to the uh, front of, uh, of his. So now we're kissing, kissing front bumpers. I bail out. I run around. I got my gun out. I'm, I remember tapping, accidentally tapping the driver's window, telling this guy, get out. He's not responding because he's slobber knocking drunk. So I, uh, luckily the car, the, the car door wasn't locked. I, 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 uh, I opened it up. I don't know how I did this because the guy is shirtless. It's summertime. He's sweaty, but somehow I, I with one hand free, I, I grab him and I throw him out and put him down on the pavement and uh, take him into custody. And I still remember the one gentleman driving up in his truck, uh, officer, you need help? And I says, nope, I got it under control. <laughs> and... And put the guy in custody, and then of course all the all the cavalry showed up. And this was your buddy's uh, patrol car. Yeah, and, and the guy who I was standing with, he doesn't move an inch. He stayed right there, never. <laughs> and of course, I, res- I it was Officer Bledsoe. Respect the guy very much, good cop. But he said it because I asked him later. Says, "What? What? Why didn't you come help?" He says, "No way. I saw a policy." I just saw policy violations up the wing wing. <laughs> I stayed right here. <laughs> um, so in your cop cars at the time, there was no cages. He just climbed over or did he get out no, and get no. in? No, no, he got out and got in. But see, I mm. left the window down for him. Oh yeah, so you he said he opened be, it. Yeah, so he could be comfortable because it's summertime. This guy's sweating up a storm, but he's, he's just a drunk passenger. Why he got into the driver's seat, once he got out, you would think he just would have ran, walked away, whatever. But no, he climbed into the driver's seat and took off. What a nut job. <laughs> he must have been very drunk. That's st- oh, he, so he, stupid. He was. So so he went from being a passenger uh, a, a witness to uh, two years in prison, a stolen car. Oh, man. And yeah. that was Bledsoe's car? You know, you know, I'm struggling to remember whose car is who now. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think the car that he stole was one of the cops that went to go find the driver, and then I jumped into my car. I think initially I had said it was my car, but no, my car was the one idling with the other guy in it, and, and I took on after him. Uh, that's one thing about cops, man. When something like that happens, you will never, ever live that down. Oh, uh, no way. And, yeah. and just, I, but you know, I was able to articulate in my memo exactly what happened. I did not get a day off. <laughs> <laughs> well, every cop leaves this car idling with the keys, and you still oh. see it nowadays. Well, yeah. You know, it's oh just, heck yeah, heck yeah. Figure it. But I was just gonna... so, th- I was just so thankful that no one got, you know, there wasn't an accident. No one got hurt. I mean, it was just remarkable that that we came out of that as clean as we did. That must have been all that was going through your mind as you're following him through the crowded streets. Like, just Uh, don't hurt someone. 
horrible. A- absolutely. And I got an unsecured yeah. drunk guy and uh, my, you know, sitting right behind me. I'm going after drunk guy. It, it was just, it could have been so bad. I'm starting to see all the policies being broken. He was talking oh. about. <laughs> oh, horrible. Horrible. <laughs> wow. That's a good one. So did he, yeah. did, did he actually do any time or did he just get us? Yeah, no, two years. Days no, off. Eight, no t- two years. Believe. Oh no. Yeah. The bad guy two got years. two years. Wow. Yeah, oh, they don't mess around in Arizona. I heard in Arizona also, like if you get a um, uh, a DUI, they will actually strap you to the gurney and take your blood. Is that true? The, you know what? Because I've been out of the game now for ten years, uh, I, but I think it is. I know that uh, I knew somebody in Idaho. They got a DUI about five years ago. They paid like five hundred dollars in fines and one and like ten days in jail in Arizona. If you get a DUI, you will get crucified with the fines. I'm not sure about days in jail, but it's going to cost you a bundle. Yeah, yeah. I have a buddy back home that got a DUI, mm-hmm. and he was trying to tell me how he beat it. And I was like, how much did you pay your attorney again? How much was the class? He's like, yeah, F you. <laughs> you never beat a yeah. DUI, you know what I mean? But um, Right. Yeah, like I, I know that like implied <laughs> consent is um, if you if you agree to get a license from the state, then you're, the implied consent is that you're going to – give your breath or blood um, to an officer if he requests it. Otherwise, you leave, right. lose your license. That's the way it is in Mass. Um, but, yeah, I had a friend of a friend back in Massachusetts was friends with an Arizona cop, and he said, I think he was on the highway patrol or a trooper or whatever you guys have that that version of. Um, he said, yeah, if we, we give them a chance and if, uh, if they don't give us a sample, we'll take them to the hospital and have a nurse take it. I was like, wow, that's, that's pretty yeah. hardcore to, like, you know, um, against someone's will, yeah, putting a needle in their arm and taking their to me that's over the top. That's a little bit of too far <laughs> to me, right? But uh, at the same time, I kind of uh, like we, it. <laughs> yeah, no, we we kind of like, like going it. too far in Arizona. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, I mean, it's like it's all part of that little contract when you get your license to drive. You're yep. agreeing to let this yep. happen if you know if you don't want to yep. play ball. There you go. Now, why you, wouldn't you? Right. People get confused. They think that having a driver's license is a constitutional right. It's not. <laughs> right. It's a, it's a well, privilege. Most, Absolutely. Most people know their rights. I mean, I've, I've, I've run into tons of people. It's amazing how many people know their rights. Oh, it's, yeah, in the booking room, of, oh, naturally. Isn't yeah. it amazing? Yeah, they, they take one law class and they know everything. And, you know, when you come up to the driver's door on the traffic stop and they want to start negotiating and you got to explain to them, okay, look, give me your license. And then I'll be happy to explain to you what's cooking. But man, they want to start negotiating, and then it goes south. You learn that quick too. If you if you let them start talking, if you start answering questions before you get that license, you're not getting yep. the license. Bam! There <laughs> you go. Shut up. And we and they uh, had they you know and you and you would think they would have been taught this. You have to present ID. You have to present license in Arizona when you're the driver of the vehicle. And I'm sure that's probably every state. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Uh, unless you're yep. a sovereign citizen, then you are bound by no law <laughs> of any land. That's, yeah. that's Ken, right. Ken, I'm not driving a car. I am traveling as a free man. As a free man, right. you have no jurisdiction over me. There's a little compound yes. in New England up in New Hampshire of um, uh, people like that. I forget what they're called, free staters or whatever. But they there's a little commune of them in, in New Hampshire, and we have one in our town stopped, not, not me, but a, a patrolman a, named, uh, officer Mungavin stopped one. And, uh, the guy was doing that whole, I'm traveling as a free man. Um, you know, there's no, your laws don't apply to me and this is blah, blah, right, blah. Right. And, uh, we have a, we had a sergeant when I was working there that was, you know, about six, one, two thirty, good sized dude. And, uh, he listened for about 30 seconds and then just reached in the window and bloop, pulled him right out, you know? And uh, yes. these are Good these stuff. are sovereign citizens. Yes, he was actually yes. the sovereign guy calmed citizens. down, I guess, in the booking room and was um, yeah, a sovereign citizen. He was, um, you know, a little more agreeable and had time to think about it. But uh, yeah, he right. was uh, he watched too many Internet videos where he, he thought he was going to school the police on the law, you know. Right, yeah. right. But, yes. Well, yes. Greg will remember this. Greg re- remember this phrase when we used to say, "Yeah, man, the guy was uh, he was starting to get froggy, so we yanked him out of the wing window." <laughs> remember that? That's right. Yes. 
Oh, that's the vent window, right? Do you, it's this. It was the wing the window, window was a little, a little, yeah, the wing like, triangle shaped window on the, yeah. on the, on the, on the, on uh, the each, uh, each, each um, driver, uh, driver door and the passenger door. There was a little tiny triangle, say, and you pull the little button up and you push the window out. It was like <laughs> a little right. vent window. Yeah, and that was a common phrase back in the day, yanking, yeah, can, or, y- yanking uh, suspects out the window. Right. Or the other one was, uh, hey, Sarge, I had my kill light. I swung in his shoulder. He ducked. I hit him in the head. And I, that, that wasn't me. He ducked. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So many suspects ducked at their every single time. <laughs> yeah, he, he ducked. I forgot about that one. <laughs> yeah. So, Greg, can you tell us about your most intense or terrifying uh, call that you went on? Yes, well, that would be my one and only uh, officer-involved shooting uh, where we responded to the Rainbow Apartments here in town, and the uh, the gentleman had just gotten out of prison, already violated parole, already smoking meth, was in possession of a three eighty in his waistband, and told his sister, I'm going to kill your husband. So she called 911, and she says, please don't tell him that I called, but he's going to kill my husband tonight. Please get here now. So we got there. We saw Mr. Nunez up on the top floor when he started down the stairs. That's when I told the guy I was with. There was four of us total. Okay, when he starts down the stairs, we're going to run run through the courtyard, and we're going we're to take him down. So this gentleman starts down the stairs. We run across the courtyard. And just as I'm ready to start screaming instructions to this guy to keep your hands, put your hands on your head, the initial officer who was – uh, dispatch to the call. He started screaming orders. There was four of us. We got in this perfect crossfire, but luckily Mr. Nunez was on a elevated position. There was two sets of stairs, uh, you know, 10 stairs to a mid-level platform and then 10 more stairs down to the ground. So he was up high. So we were all aiming high. And when uh, Scott, uh, Officer Bornstead, started screaming instructions at Mr. Nunez, I'm seeing Nunez's hands are down by his waist they were not up on his head. He wasn't putting them up on his head. And I'm thinking, man, I just knew this. I just knew things weren't going to be good. And I don't even see the gentleman draw. All of a sudden, the gun is out. He starts uh, popping caps at Bornstead. We then return fire, and uh, we all shot a collective 20 rounds. Ten of them hit, mm. all in his mid, all in the midsection, all in his lower torso and hip area. Uh, he finally, it would seem like forever, uh, he finally fell, and he probably died just as he was hitting the ground, according to what the medical examiner said. And unfortunately, Officer Bornstead took two two uh, rounds to his legs. Uh, he had, uh, uh, not pipes, but rods put in his legs, and he eventually returned back to uh, full duty. But, you know, I can still, like in the war pictures, I can still remember someone's shell, I'm sure it was my shell, my 45, the shell in slow motion and the gunpowder and the ringing in your ear, and you just can't believe what you've just been through. And then I was the first guy to jump on the radio and scream for rescue and, you know, the 999 shots fired and all that stuff. Mm. Wow, that's intense. And there was, um, you said there was kind of a, a crossfire going on. How many of you guys were surrounding him? Yeah, yeah, there was four of us. We were at his 12, 9, 6, and 3. At the time, I don't know that. But luckily, because he was elevated, my rounds went over Officer Rosas, probably missing his skull by about probably three to four feet. Oh, good. That's plenty of clearance. That's good. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Holy cow, that's that's intense, man. And um, yeah. did you notice when you were firing the rounds where you're, um, you know – you notice right away when you go to the shooting range and you forget to put on your ear protection. It just takes one round and you're like, woo. Um, Oh yeah. But I hear a lot in, in shootings, your ears kind of do a natural, uh, the the adrenaline or the dump or something prevents your hearing from being injured. Did you notice that at all? Yeah. I I didn't even notice the, uh, the sound of the, the guns going off. Uh, But I noticed the first thing was there was a lot of smoke uh, the gunpowder smell, and mm. then the ringing—the ringing in the ears—came a little, 
a few seconds later. But the only thing, the, the one thing that was really, as we started having to shoot the gentleman, man, I'm just going, man, why doesn't this guy fall down? But he actually fell within a couple of seconds. But mm -hmm. you're just sitting there. I, I cranked off five. I hit him twice. I was six feet away. Uh, I don't know how I did that. But anyway, uh, it, he finally fell. And then that's when everybody starts screaming in the radios. Yeah, yeah. I imagine those, um, I've heard that before too, those those seconds are stretched out. They feel like minutes, but it's just, you know, you're just waiting Absolutely. for gravity to happen. And it's just feeling Absolutely. like forever. Yes, yes. Wow, man, that's intense. And um, it, was, it was, yes. And that was it. He was cashed out right there at the scene probably. Right. Uh, an, office, an officer, there was two other guys that came up, a sergeant and another officer. He grabbed uh, the gentleman and, and had to drag him down the stairs so rescue could start working on him. It was funny. When the rescue guys get there, there was a total of seven EMS workers. Five of them started working on the bad guy, and only two guys were working on Bornstead. So we were kind of upset with that later. But it turns out when the, all the firemen got there, they were just aware of the victim, well, suspect now, victim down on the ground. Uh, they weren't aware that uh, Bornstead had been shot, so all the firemen started working on uh, the, the the shooter. Gotcha. And the, you guys all carry 45s? Yeah. That was this like, standard yes. issue? That's a, yeah, six-hour six hour 45. It's a P220, mm -hmm. is that right? Uh, gosh, I, I'm such yeah, a nerd. I think so. <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I'm not a gun guy. I'm not um, a gun guy. Yeah, that's a <laughs> big round to get shot with a bunch of times, especially for the, the other officer who was in the crossfire, man. You got, where you get shot in the upper yes. leg, like the femur? Uh, yeah, one, I'm trying to remember. One was up above the kneecap, and I know one was down by the ankle. And now I'm trying to remember, was it one leg or was it one in each? And I, I, Maybe it was both legs, but I'm not remembering now. Damn. But it's a, but I, I he he kind of fell back after he got shot and he was laying down. So I I came to help him, and as I round the corner, he raised up. I remember his gun raising up, man. And I all I saw was muzzle. And I told him, I says, hey hey Scott, it's me, it's me. So he, he, luckily he didn't shoot me. Yeah, that's something you don't yeah. think about. You're um you know. Right. You, you've been shot, so your body's going into complete survival mode, and it's going to take right. a split second to identify good and bad. That Dude, that's scary. You're, you are lucky to yeah, shoot no. you. Yeah, I, I didn't think about it then. I thought about it later. You should have shot the guy in the leg who shot him. Right. <laughs> okay, bring that guy right. over here. <laughs> yeah. I owe him one. Yeah, but, you know, and, and normally in situations like this, you know, there's a lot of uh, – protest or the family's upset why do you got to do why do you have to shoot our our uncle our our, our dad our husband and it there was none of that uh the family was very uh sorry that he that the shooter you know shot us and that uh he had to put us through all that and so we got a lot of uh positive uh feedback from from community and uh immediate family oh that's that's nice. That's rare. Yeah, no, that yeah, that was good. Now Yuma, Yuma, the city is um, it's pretty famous, Old West City. I mean, it's in westerns and stuff. I'm kind of curious. Right. Do you guys have any um, like here, one of our cities near where I am, Colton, um, the first chief of police was Virgil Earp, which is really cool. Like you go in the station, I guess. I haven't seen it, but there's a, you know, they have all the chiefs. And one of them is, um, you know, Virgil Earp, who's famous, um, famous lawman, was Wyatt Earp's older brother. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything like that in uh, in Yuma? Did, was there any famous lawmen that were worked for you guys? You know, I can't at the top of my head. I can't think of anything. Well, um, yeah, I, I, yeah, Dude, you I could make one I, up maybe to make the my question hit a little better. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, I mean. Well, we had the old prison, of course, or the old Yuma prison, and that that's a museum here, and uh, that's where, you know, they would arrest folks and put them in the old Yuma prison, but uh, can't think of any gunslingers or anything like any history. Uh, I'm not not familiar. Is there a anything. motorcycle? Is there a motorcycle run out there? There is. They, they call yeah. it the Prison Hill Run. That's a. There I think you, it's in there May. You there you go, Steve. What does that yeah. mean? Motorcycle run. 
Uh, they do a yearly uh, uh, motorcycle ride out there from all different areas. They converge on this place. Oh, yep. I heard yep. Andy Oakley was the first chief of police there, so that's interesting. I, I, I just made I, that up. I was going to say, okay, great, great. <laughs> so that's, well, that's that would the be, truth. That would be, yeah, that would be sad if you know Yuma history and I don't. So let's not <laughs> let's not go there. Uh, that would be horrible. Oh, uh, that's funny. Um, yeah, Greg. Uh, you you kind of have an interesting story about um, a run in with law enforcement yourself. I'd like to hear about. I uh, I do not that that's really that interesting to me, but if you must hear it, uh, yeah, <laughs> I was a high school kid. Me and my buddy, uh, we went and worked out of the melons. Uh, we you know Yuma is a large uh, agriculture industry, and we went out. And we worked the fields and for for extra money in the summer. So we were working the melons and realized we needed gloves because the uh, the crops that kind of work your hands over a little bit after a full day of picking melons. So we decided, hey, let's go to the supermarket. Let's go get some gloves. So we walked into the supermarket. Every intention on buying the gloves. My buddy pulled two pairs of work gloves off of the display, and he looked around, and he lifted up his shirt and threw the one pair of gloves in, under his shirt, under his I guess stuffed it in his waistband, handed me the second pair of gloves, and of course, me being me, I guess, uh, dumb guy, uh, I looked around, didn't see anybody, and, and threw my pair under, you know, tucked it in my waistband. And as we started to walk out of the store, we were 16 years old, uh, the store manager caught us, and we got uh, then uh, driven to the police station by Officer Bobby Hudson, who I would later work with. And uh, he processed us, and our parents came to the uh, police station. Uh, our dads and uh, took us home and it, it, it was, it sucked. It was terrible. Yeah. But how old were you? Yeah. 16, 16, 16. Yeah. I, that's so interesting. I love hearing those stories about cops before they were cops getting in trouble. You know, oh, yeah. a lot of people think it's over for them when they get into backgrounds or before they go in like, well, I was arrested once or I could never be a cop now, but it's so not true. My dad was, um, my dad retired a Lieutenant back in the East coast and he was, him and his friend got arrested for joyriding his dad's car and drinking beers. And then there you go. The, the patrolman that arrested him ended up being his sergeant years later, you know? So yeah. That's interesting. Wow. So was, that was the only time you've been arrested. Yeah, that was it. Uh, <laughs> and, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I knew that would be the last time. But, you know, I mean, I you know, you, know, you always hear the suspect say, officer, it, this is the first time I've ever done this. Which of course it isn't. They've shoplifted many, many times before, right. and they got caught. Well, believe it or not, this is the first uh, the first time I've shoplifted, and of course now it's the only time because I got arrested. And then uh, the uh, backstory on all this was, uh, and then I get hired, and then that poor store manager he was held up at gunpoint robbery at the uh, El Rancho Market that he worked at, and. Uh, he handed over the money, but then he made a bunch of commotion to try to get, you know, witnesses. And that that son of a gun shot and killed that that poor guy. And uh, we we knew the Prey family. His last name was Prey, and uh, it was just a sad deal. Oh man, that's terrible. Yeah. How awful. So he was trying to like, he was trying to get people to rally against the guy before he left. Uh, yeah. I, I, I guess he he resisted. He did something. I don't don't know exactly what it was, but he drew attention to to getting robbed. And and uh, Mr. Grover, I think his last name was Grover, the suspect, uh, shot and uh, killed him after he took the money. Oh wow, that's a shame. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I that manager. I mean, I have a lot to thank. You know, be thankful for. I'm glad he caught me. Maybe I was going to keep shoplifting. I don't know. But that was a good thing that happened to me and that we weren't going to do that tomfoolery anymore. Absolutely. Yeah. Greg, can you tell us about a, a positive situation? Hey, Steve, you didn't tell us a straight up. What's that, Ken? I was going to say, you didn't tell me Greg was a straight up thug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's sure. a gangster. Yeah. Greg, can you tell well, we us? To, we, we, well, real quick, we used to ride 10 speeds uh, when we were teenagers, and so we felt we needed a name for our club like we were a gang, so I suggested the Fells Angels. 
But uh, that didn't go over that <laughs> great. So. Oh, yeah, you can have all kinds uh, of fun with that last name. Yeah, I guess you can. <laughs> um, can you tell us about a heartwarming situation or positive encounter? Yes, yes. And this goes back to me being a deer officer. Uh, at the time you're doing deer, you know, you maybe don't really think you're making the impact that you're making. You're just, you're going through the motions, you're teaching the lessons, say no to drugs. There's 17 total lessons and you target the sixth graders, which is the core class, the core group that you are targeting, but you teach all uh, grades, kindergarten through six. But anyway, uh, as I uh, evolved and, and got out of dare and then and did other uh, uh, job uh, jobs at the uh, human police department, you know, I had, as these dare students grew up, they would approach me later at the store or whatever I was doing, sometimes on duty, sometimes off duty, and they would say, hey, Officer Fell, I, I want to thank you for, for everything that you did for me when you were a dare officer and I was your, I was your dare student. I mean, you, you helped me to stay off of drugs. And, and if I had anything to do with it, great. Uh, and so that those are pretty good stories. I, I mean, mo- they just would happen all the time. Hey, Fell, you know, I don't smoke because of you. Hey, Fell, I, I became a police officer, and, and it, was, it, was, it was good stuff. That's awesome, man. It sounds like you've had some yep. good impacts. And as you know, being a police officer for as long as you have been, um, you will go for long stretches without that positive uh, reinforcement. Right. So that's cool. I know that um, Chris, yep. Christine thinks the world is. She, um, she's, um, you know, looking to get into law enforcement, and uh, you've uh, definitely impacted her life. So you're, you're still well, at uh, it. I, hey, I, I hope so. But I'll tell you what. Uh, the first five minutes speaking to that girl, I immediately, because I'm the unofficial recruiter for Yuma Police Department, not that I work there now, but I want everybody to go there and be a cop. And I told her, you need to be a cop because she's going to get behind that computer and, and light that keyboard up. And she will do reports and be back out in the, on the road in a half hour. Unlike me, I was a horrible, horrible report writer, as, a, as some cops are. And some of us spend all shift behind the stupid computer, which back then was a typewriter, doing the stupid reports. But she's going to be very fast and she's very articulate. She's very intelligent. She's got the, um, it's funny cause I, I told her that I said, I could tell you're gonna, you're gonna make it through and you're going to be a good police officer. And she's kind of like, you know, why, why would you say that? But she's one of those people you can just tell she has the right stuff for it. You know, she's oh, sharp. Absolutely. She's got a wicked sense of humor. She's going to, she's going to yes. do great for the community. Oh, uh, she, she's got command presence. That's the first thing I noticed. And everybody mistakes her for being in the military. Cause she told me that she's, you know, everybody thinks I'm in the military. You know, she's got this, she's got this tight jawline and just, just her command presence and her confidence. Yeah. Oh, she's, she's going to do great. That's awesome. Very cool. Well, Greg, you, you started to tell us a little bit when we started the podcast, but can you expand on um, some advice for new officers or police candidates? Yep. Uh, I, I would tell them, uh, because two things I really started getting good at that I wasn't in the beginning was a, a report writer and being a public servant. You know, don't ever forget that you were hired to serve the public. You are a public servant. They do pay us, and they do call us, and they expect us to to serve them and, and to help them. Sometimes uh, the badge gets a little heavy on our shirt, and we kind of forget that we are their servant. We are a public servant, and we, we get a little arrogant. We get a little lazy. We, we kind of forget that they are the reason that we have our job and that we work for them with them. And, and it's very easy to become very cynical and, and anti-person because of all the lies that have been told to us. Every person you stop, certain weeks there's a glass pipe in their pocket, and you start to lose a lot of faith and respect in the public that you work for. But you have to remember that that's a small percentage of the public that you work for. And so always try to be very uh, cordial and very uh, courteous. But, but always give your A game to any person that ever calls you. And then the second thing would be 
just try to be the best report writer you can be because if you can't put it on paper, then you're really no good to anybody. You're going to have to articulate on paper. And that is the big challenge. Some of these new recruits we get, uh, man, they just can't write a lick. That would be me. I, I was terrible. If I would have been hired at this day and age now, I, I would not have made it, that they would have let me go because my report writing was so bad. So that would be the two things I would suggest to any new guy. Write, write well, articulate well, and also always remember you're a public servant and, and don't ever forget that. Great advice, man. That, and that is very um very good to bring up the the report writing thing because a lot of people think they're just going to become a cop and kick ass, take names, right. and then walk away. No, you're going to go to a call no. and then you go sit in the station for an hour and a half and uh, yep. pound out a uh, tedious report about it. And if you're not careful with it and you try to rush it later, if it goes to court, you're going to be embarrassed. So <laughs> it's and, and and I've lived that several times. Uh, wow, has, sure. Oh, it's horrible. Yep. Yes. Yeah. I'm, Oh man, a member of my family got um one of my cousins when he was younger got a DUI. I remember, and he uh they got to report, you know, and um it was his first offense and whatever, and uh, the the cops report had um the wrong name, first and last name, in like two thirds of the report, and yep. it's because he had a template for DUI. So when he got a DUI, he was changed the road names and change around the field sobriety a little bit, but he left the last person's name in the report, you know? And uh, yeah, it, defense attorneys love to see that because they go, who's this person? Did you arrest two people no. that night? Oh, wait, you're not. Yeah. You were so careless with your report that you couldn't put the right name in. So how could you take proper observations on the side of the road at nighttime? You know, it was, in, there you, go. you know, it was a big victory for my cousin. And, uh, you know, I don't know if it helped yes. him learn a lesson or not, but he was pretty, pretty psyched about it. Right. Yes. No, I, I became a, a, a decent report writer, but boy, it, it took me about seven, eight, nine years. And I finally, it, the light switch finally went on and, and I finally got decent at it. But I, I would go back and look at my reports back in the day. And, oh, they were, they, they were terrible. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hear you, man. I, I worked with some old school guys and um, they were not fan of reports and they would, you know, no. they were, they were used to, I mean, you legit could go to a, a bar fight and do a two sentence report. Went to bar fight, mm, broke I, it up. That's yep, it. I hear you. And yep, uh, they, we, we, I mean, that sounds awesome to me too. Yep. Yep. I'm Not telling anymore. you like they, the, the old DPS guy, uh, Dave Smith. I think I got his name right. Dave Smith. He would come out in training films, but he was a funny guy. And he would always say, uh, uh, saw suspect arrested. Same. <laughs> <laughs> and, that was, and that was his report. And you know, of course, you can't do that. But but he was just, yeah. That's a beautiful thing. Yeah. I love it. Hey, Ken, do you have any um, any more questions for Greg? No. Good to go. Oh, it's been awesome. I've been enjoying listening. Excellent. No, yeah, yeah. I, I, hey, I, I thank you very much for the invite to uh, be on your show and to to talk to you guys about police stuff. It's I tell you what, it, it gets in the blood, doesn't it? And I am no different. Uh, mm -hmm. I still listen to the police radio, the YPD channel. I watch cops. I, I'm a junkie. Yeah, I'm just, I'm a, I'm a junkie. Right. That's awesome, Greg. I, yeah. I got to tell you, man, <laughs> talking to you lifted me up. I, I love to see a guy who you're so committed. You're still, you're no slouch. You're still out there. You're still, like I said, on, on like, newspaper article, articles of you slapping high fives to uh, new students and, it's just awesome, man. That's um, that's the way it should be, and um, I'm just happy for your long and successful career. Well, mm -hmm. thank you very much, Steve and Kevin. I can I appreciate it. All right, brother. Well, thank you. Thank you again okay. for coming on, and we'll we'll be in touch. Hey, you guys, keep fighting the fight, and keep uh, talking to cops, and this is this is great stuff. And and tell Christine I said hi. Absolutely, sir. All right, thank you, Greg. Okay. All right, Greg. All right, have a good day. Take care. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you'd like to support the show, go over to thingspolicey.com. Uh, when you get on the website, there's a few different ways you can show some support. You can donate directly. You can do a one-time donation or a monthly donation. Um, even a buck um, helps us uh, keep the lights on over here, pays our expenses for the month, is greatly appreciated. You can also just use our Amazon affiliate link. If you just want to buy something on Amazon like you normally do, just do it through our link 
and um, we'll get a little kickback for that. So you can go to the website and do that, or uh, in the show notes, I'll put a link. You can just click right through that link. And the third way is you can buy some uh, you can buy some merch. So we have um, coffee mugs, we have T-shirts, men's and women's, and we also have hoodie sweatshirts now. So uh, go over to thingspleasesee.com and check it out. You can also just um, listen to the podcast there, or you can apply to be a guest. Just scroll down to and click on Be a Guest, and what you want to do is just give us a brief uh, synopsis of your of your service, how many years you uh, were on the job and uh, just a very brief idea of the stories you'd like to share. And I will get right back to you. So thank you for listening and we'll catch you next time.